What's up, everybody? My name is Dimitri Kafinas, and you're listening to Hidden Forces, a podcast that inspires investors, entrepreneurs, and everyday citizens to challenge consensus narratives and to learn how to think critically about the systems of power shaping our world. My guest in this episode is Alex Lee Moyer, the filmmaker behind an excellent new documentary about one of the most controversial people in America. I'm talking, of course, about Alex Jones, the founder of InfoWars, a popular alternative news platform whose size and influence has become especially difficult to measure since Alex himself was banned from YouTube and most every other major media and social media platform almost four years ago to the day. This was a uniquely exciting conversation for me to have, partly because I was myself a very engaged Alex Jones listener for about two years after the great financial crisis. And so I came into this conversation with a pre-existing relationship to and experience of Alex and a real fascination with his popularity and with what it says about our relationship to truth, our distrust of mainstream institutions, and this broader cultural and political moment that we're all living through. The name of the documentary is Alex's War. And as you will hear from our discussion, I really enjoyed this film. It takes a lot of courage and objectivity to produce a documentary about such a socially divisive person or topic that can appeal to people across the political spectrum. And I think this film does that, and I cannot recommend it enough. For anyone who is new to the Hidden Forces podcast, we are a listener-supported show. So if you want access to our premium content, as well as the transcripts and intelligence reports, which include my takeaways from every episode, head over to hiddenforces.io, select the episode that you're interested in, and click on the premium extras, where you can then sign up to one of our premium content tiers. And with that, please enjoy this week's conversation with my guest, documentary filmmaker, Alex Lee Moyer. Alex Lee Moyer, welcome to Hidden Forces. Thanks for having me here, Dimitri. I'm so excited to have you on, Alex. I've actually really been looking forward to this conversation, and I've wanted to have more conversations like this one, and it's been surprisingly difficult to curate them. But I spent uh, the last five days in a just deep, I was red pilling myself day after day after day going through, uh, not just watching your really great two documentaries that you've done, both Alex's War, which is which focuses on Alex Jones and Infowars, and we'll get into this, the larger kind of you'll have to explain sort of how you were, what your vision was with the documentary, but the larger kind of movement around Alex. And also TFW No GF, which was your previous documentary, which was on, you know, shorthand, the word we use is quote incels, mm -hmm. but I know that you don't like that word and I don't think it really captures what the film is about. But that film in particular, but both films really touch on a lot of the larger sociocultural phenomena that I've found very interesting that I think are really important to our society and not talked about enough. But I also spent hours and hours revisiting Alex Jones. And I think I told you in my email, my introductory email, that I probably have watched over 500 hours of Alex Jones content. Thinking back on it, I think it's actually closer to a thousand. Mm -hmm. And you know, listeners don't know much about this because I haven't talked about it much. But of course, I created and produced a show on RT. And I did so after going through this you know, long, dark period in my life during and after the bailouts of 2008, where I started going down a series of rabbit holes on the internet, starting with uh, Peter Joseph's Zeitgeist. Then I found Alex Jones and I watched just hours and hours of Alex footage. I would, you know, he, at the time, I think he was doing four hours a day and I was watching all four hours and I was watching all these different guests that he had on his show. I can't even remember all of them, but I gave you a bunch of their names. And I think it was all part of this thing where the world that I understood to be true, the rules that I thought were sacrosanct, how I thought government operated, et cetera, all came crashing down after the 2008 financial crisis. And I went out looking for answers. And that entire process has ultimately led me here to where I am today with this show. So I want to set this conversation up by asking listeners two things. One, to keep an open mind in this conversation. There's no judgment here. We're trying to have uh, 
again, an open-minded conversation about an individual who has been deplatformed and about much larger topics that I think arise from that and from him and that he, I think, has been grappling with for many years himself, and to hold contradictory ideas in your head at once. And if I didn't say it already, try to suspend your, your sense of judgment around a lot of these issues that oftentimes we develop um, approaches to based on what we're told or what um, what we think will be punished for or not be punished for. So super long-winded, impromptu introduction, Alex. What I would love to start with in this conversation is to learn a little bit more about you. Because I've, again, I've done, I've done my research, as Alex would say, and I've done my research, Alex. And I, I know you moved around quite a bit, so I can't really ask you where you're from, but where are you from? You know what I mean? Like, how would you answer that question? I did move around a lot as a kid. I, I spent my formative time in high school in Central California, but before that, I grew up between upstate New York, Florida, Arkansas, and then I spent a few years in in Fresno, California, and then after that, I went to college in Portland, and then I lived in New York City for a number of years, and then I lived in L.A. for about 10 years, and so I've been all over the place, and now I'm in Texas, and I generally kind of move around depending on whatever um, I'm doing with work and wherever it kind of takes me. Yeah, I moved around a lot as a kid too. I'm curious how that influenced you, how that's made you who you are today. Maybe you found it to be something that you found fit your natural rhythms or did it actually make you someone that kind of, I mean, I'm curious to know how it impacted you. I mean, I don't really have a point of reference for it because that's just how it was for me growing up. So I can't compare it to a different experience, but I do believe that it's probably made me more adaptable, more flexible, and it's made it in some ways maybe more socially adept, but also fine with being by myself, I guess. I mean, I don't know. There's probably a deep psychology of people who move around a lot growing up, and I probably fit that composite. Hmm. Yeah, some people take to it, some people don't. I'd seen this, uh, well, it might have been like a 60-minute piece or something, or maybe it was an article about Tom Hanks and how he grew up in a family, I believe, where he moved around a lot. And it was difficult for everyone except for him. He loved it. Whenever they moved, and they moved around like every couple of years, they moved to a new place, whole new state or school district or whatever, and he loved it. So it's interesting how different people take different things from those experiences. I definitely don't feel traumatized by it or anything like that. I do think that it's given me a certain level of autonomy and I've never really considered it to be a, a negative aspect of my upbringing. Hmm. Um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, your, for lack of a better word, career progression, which I think is a kind of a weird word to use when you're an artist doesn't really feel natural. How would you describe your progression as a filmmaker? How how you got to where you are today? Like how did, how did that process begin and what were the important moments in it? Uh it was a pretty meandering route I think compared with other filmmakers. I as a child growing up knew that I wanted to do something related to film, but I kind of cast that aspiration aside because it didn't feel realistic and I didn't know anybody or grow up around anybody that was doing that kind of thing. And strangely, I feel like I kind of arrived there without even being really that focused about it. Although I began working in film by teaching myself how to use Final Cut Pro when I was in my early 20s at a weekend class at the Apple store. And that's because I wanted to make music videos for friends that I knew and bands in Portland. And I was much more interested in music back then. And through that, I learned how to edit. And through knowing how to edit, everything else seems sort of easy after you know how to edit. And I think that editing is the main barrier of entry for people when it comes to making 
your own films. So if anybody wants to become an independent filmmaker, I recommend you get as good at editing as you can. Mm. So what story would you say that you have been trying to tell, if that's even an accurate, uh, sort of a relevant question? I don't mean with this latest documentary, which we'll get into, but what's the journey that you've been on as a storyteller? I don't see myself as, well, it's still forming, but I honestly am just trying to make work that interests me enough to sustain the process of seeing something through from start till finish. Another thing that happens with people in filmmaking is they lose interest and, you know, they forget why they're doing what they're doing. And so I mostly just try to focus on making work about things that I'm interested in. And that's the main driving factor as opposed to having some sort of agenda that I'm trying to like put forth. Although subconsciously, obviously people can probably look at the the body of my work so far and notice recurring themes. But I think that's pretty much the same with most people in their work. But in terms of what those themes are, obviously there's a lot related to socio-political issues and things kind of have picked up for me at kind of the advent of the quote-unquote culture wars. So you can draw a thread between my films around those kinds of issues, although the films are very different from each other. Okay, so let's talk about your latest film. The film is called Alex's War. I guess, <laughs> why did you choose that name? That's a in some ways it's obvious, but I'm curious to know where the name came from. Well, when people are speaking about Alex Jones, they're usually kind of talking about him in terms of being the other. And he's this, to a lot of people, especially in these these mainstream narratives, he's a kind of a supervillain character. And I thought it would be interesting to sort of call him by his first name. But I also like that it sort of sounds like an 80s like young adult novel <laughs> title or a Stephen King book or something. You know, the term information war, info wars, it seems so obvious. It's like he says in the film, like it, we kind of call it what it is. And I knew that it's not just an information war for Alex, but it's a little bit of a, a war between good and evil. And that's sort of the, the motivating force of his life. So it made a lot of sense to call it that. Yeah. So actually, let's tell our listeners who Alex Jones is, because some people may not know who he is. So who is he? How would you describe him? So it's I'm pretty sure everybody knows who Alex Jones is at this point because he's so omnipresent in headlines, especially here in America. But if you were to explain to a space alien or who, that just landed who Alex Jones was, he's an extremely famous, extremely controversial American figure in broadcasting. He began and came out of Austin, Texas in the mid 90s around the height of what I consider to be the patriot movement in America at that time. And there were a lot of sort of major watershed moments that happened around that time that created basically an underground scene of conspiracy theorists that, you know, had a platform on public access television here in Austin. And Alex became the, sort of the shining star that emerged out of that and went on to get great notoriety through being sort of a cultural fixture here in Austin, but also for sort of issuing these predictions about events and observations about events that made him extremely popular. And now he is mostly known for remarks around the you know, Sandy Hook massacre in 2012 and his affiliation with Donald Trump. And that made him sort of a lightning rod for, um, you know, uh, the progressive slash neoliberal movement in America to sort of quash any alternative narrative around those events. And he's sort of a, a, a the mascot for the American populist movement also. Yeah, I think that's a pretty good summary. I've never been to Austin believe it or not. How well known is Alex there? I actually don't know what his day-to-day -day life is like here in Austin, but 
I think pretty much anywhere he goes. In fact, I've spent more time traveling with him than I even here in Austin. I, If I need to see him, I'll go down to his studio where he spends a great deal of his time. He probably spends, you know, 12 hours a day there if I had to guess. So I know that in the 90s, he was much more social and got around a lot more famously had friendships with, you know, Richard Linklater. He's friends with Joe Rogan here, who's obviously, you know, an import, but he was kind of disregarded. He wasn't really regarded as being dangerous. It was more that he was just part of the landscape. And there was, there was definitely a culture here of those sort of, you know, the populist elements. And so it, he, he wasn't really considered to be dangerous back then, like people consider him to be now. So is that, I mean, that's a good question because again, like I'm very familiar with Alex, but I stopped watching him around 2011 or so. And I'm not really entirely clear beyond some of the documentaries like Megyn Kelly or when his appearance on Piers Morgan, as well as some of the instances where his name came up when he was mentioned by Hillary Clinton, let's say, or alluded to by Barack Obama in that clip where he said that Alex Jones, again, he didn't name him, but that Alex Jones said that he and, and Hillary Clinton smell like sulfur, implying, of course, that they're demons of some sort or another. I'm not entirely clear myself on just how, let's say, demonized he has become within certain sectors of society, within certain ecosystems. I mean, is there quite a bit of time or was there quite a bit of time spent discussing Alex Jones specifically on, let's say, CNN or MSNBC or some of the more left-leaning or mainstream media outlets in the last five years? Are you saying that you haven't picked up on the fact that he's like the most hated man in America besides Trump? No, oh. no, no, I, I, I haven't. Look, I mean, to be clear, I've heard his name mentioned. I know he was banned, but I don't watch mainstream news. Well, that's refreshing. So I, yeah, I think it's poisonous, actually. And I've talked about this wow. before. I think mainstream cable news outlets are, well, we they, we can get into that. And I'm sure we'll have a chance to discuss that. But again, I think this is why this conversation is nuanced, mm. because I have my own views about the quality of journalism that Alex does or the kind right. of information he puts out. I mean, we, in fact, it's kind of right there in how he describes the information ecosystem. Alex talks about it as an information war. His company is called Infowars. He sees everything as propaganda. In fact, I think that's a quote from your documentary as well. And so the kind of journalism he does is not the kind of journalism that I think America needs mm -hmm. or wants, but that's a separate conversation right. and maybe we'll get into it. But yes, yeah, so I don't actually have a really clear idea about what the mainstream narrative that has been perpetuated about Alex is. So I'm curious to, to hear from you what that is. Well, there's another part that is, seems so obvious that I take it for granted that I don't even mention it, which is that a lot of Alex's quote unquote appeal is that he's not really just a journalist. He's a really larger than life, bombastic, hyperbolic. At times he is almost evangelical in his delivery of you know, his content. And so that makes him a firebrand and it does make him a, a natural heel for people on the quote unquote left. Although I don't really know that those terms mean anything hmm. anymore like they used to, but his major point of notoriety now, despite his 25 year and plus career is the fallout around Sandy Hook. And for many people in America, that's all that they know about him or, you know, his claims that Sandy Hook was a hoax and a false flag event. If you know anything more about Alex Jones, you know that that, of course, follows a pattern of what Alex has been talking about around every major event in the last 25 years. So that wasn't really a one-time thing. Mm -hmm. um, he said the same thing about 9-11. He said the same thing about the Oklahoma City bombing. And that's sort of his modus operandi is when something big happens like that, especially something tragic, he's the first one to sort of point the finger at the new world order, as he says. Mm. So he tells a story, he paints a picture, and it's definitely a larger than life narrative. And, and a lot of people are very entertained by it. And that's why I think he's gained such an appeal. But also, I think that's why so many people have a knee-jerk reaction to him. 
You know, the thing also about Alex is I, I wouldn't, I think you've described him as charismatic. I have never really found him charismatic, but I have found him endearing, which I think a lot of people um, who revel in maybe demonizing Alex Jones have a hard time squaring. They have a hard time maybe holding two contradictory ideas in their head at once, that he can be both endearing and also an enormous source of misinformation, in part because of his cynicism around mainstream media institutions and his predisposition towards conspiracy. And that actually is a good segue to your documentary and the way that you chose to open it, which is with this very retro, bare bones, one shot of Alex sitting at a table. And he says to the camera, the story you're about to see is true. All of it is verifiable mm -hmm. and documented right. from the news articles to the actual first time to be ever seen video from inside. This is reality. Truth is stranger than fiction. And like I said, I felt transported to my childhood living room, sitting on wall-to-wall -wall carpeted floors, watching Robert Stack in a trench coat about to pull <laughs> back the curtain on some unsolved mystery. And then the next scene takes place in Washington, D.C., where you have BLM protesters and Trump supporters walking past one another, and in some instances yelling at one another. And while watching the continuation of that scene, I felt this sense of unfettered, subversive experimentation mm -hmm. that, like I said, to me, was reminiscent of my early childhood. And in some ways, even though it didn't have anything to do with the internet, it brought up feelings like that. And I think maybe what it also brought for me was more of the human element. And I think you did such a great job in this documentary, Alex, of bringing that up, because I think one of the themes that has always been consistent with Alex that I've always felt from him, and this might also offer us an opportunity to kind of understand a bit more about him and what drives him and what really, what he really means when he uses, when he talks about a lot of different things. I think Alex also, so much of what Alex's broadcasts are, are his internal perception of the world. And that perception, we all have different perceptions and we color them in different ways and we use metaphors and and to whatever degree that's real right. for Alex, it's real for Alex. But what I think is so core to who he is, is this idea that humanity is sacred and the world is being dehumanized. Humanity is being killed choked off, taken away, where our humanity is being taken away from us. And I definitely felt that through the documentary. I'm curious to understand why you chose to open the film that way, juxtaposing those two separate scenes and what you were trying to, to capture in that. Okay. Well, the first clip, I always knew that I wanted to do a cold open on the film with vintage clip of Alex because I just wanted to give uninitiated people, I wanted to let them know that it was going to be a film not just about the present, but also about the past and um, about his arc. And also for the same reason that you just mentioned, I'm like you, like I, I love to see stuff like that. I love working with archival footage, but especially that clip, I took it from outtakes of his Bohemian Grove film. And what I liked about it is that he sort of introduces himself and he sort of sums up his ideology so that you can watch that and you know what the film is about. I mean, you could really just, I mean, it really just puts a bow on the whole thing, that clip. So we open with that. But then also just going back to your earlier statements about how Alex has, you know, spread misinformation and is he a journalist or is he an entertainer? I sort of take that perception of him for granted. I even take my own perception of him that way for granted. And that's why I sandwiched in between those two clips. There's a disclaimer that basically says, hey, this is a movie about Alex Jones. Take everything he says with a grain of salt. Uh, this is a character study. This is not me trying to sell you on all of Alex's ideas. So I think that's a really important distinction that I needed to make. And of course, you know, some people have looked at this film and they've still decided that I was, you know, a mouthpiece for him, blah, blah, blah. But it really was about trying to convey what you're talking about, a sense of Alex's personality and his motivations. Um, and then the second clip, it felt 
interesting in juxtaposition with the first clip because in that moment, especially being there and like shooting those moments leading up to January 6th, you really got a sense of the division and sort of this weird sense of, I felt very melancholy about, um, about th- th- those, those, that scene gives me, it gave me a very melancholy feeling as if to say, well, right now we're losing the war <laughs> for humanity. I mean, if you were just to have like a snapshot, because the atmosphere was just, was so sad and dystopic. And I just wanted to kind of convey that as the backdrop for the present. So you have the past, which is this idealistic place. And then you have the present, which felt a little bit grim. And I mean, that wasn't something that I was trying to manipulate. That was how it actually felt when I was shooting the film. So I think it just came through. What do you think that's about, that the rising divisions in our country? Where do you think that stems from? Social media. (laughs) Do you think it's almost entirely technological? Yes, I do. I think that people have always been different from each other, but now people use those differences as leverage against one another, and people in places of power can more easily manipulate people's emotions and values, and I feel like it's almost entirely just civilization adjusting to an onslaught of information, which is why another reason why I really wanted to make this film. Yeah. I mean, I I thought about this quite a bit because in preparation for this conversation, I also watched about seven hours from the Sandy Hook trial. And in that trial, there were all sorts of instances where the prosecution really made a compelling case and put forward stuff that Alex said on his show that just was totally disconnected from reality. Mm -hmm. And yet at the same time, when I listened to Alex sermonize and when I listened, when I watched the documentary and there's a part of me that starts to agree with him and it's really weird. (laughs) It's a really weird thing that happens to me and I can't quite make sense of it. If I had to guess- Mm -hmm. I would say it comes back to this, that our sense of reality has been assaulted. First of all, we could, again, as we've done on this show, for people that are new listeners, we've done episodes focused very much on trying to understand the world ontologically or whether or not that's even possible. I'll point to the two episodes, one with Patrick Grimm on mind-body philosophy and another one with David Chalmers on the hard body problem and simulation. So- without getting into conversations about what is possibly knowable at all, I think there is a consensus view of reality. And I think that societies go through periods where they're pretty much in sync on what's true and what's not true. And I think that in my lifetime, the gap between the officially sanctioned reality, what institutions and quote elites are telling us on a regular basis is happening versus what we feel to be true has never been wider again, in my lifetime. yeah, And I think what Alex speaks to is that gap. Yes. So what do you think is going on there? Do you think that it's just what's happened over the years as his audience has gotten bigger? Or rather, as a result of the fact that this gap has grown, people have left mainstream media institutions in search of something else. And so this is what has been driving interest in Alex Jones's content. Right. Well, first of all, it doesn't help that sometimes he's right. So that doesn't help clear anything up for anybody. But I think what people like, and this relates to what you just said, is that whether he's right or whether he's just riffing and he's just saying whatever, he's giving a v- more of a voice to people's feelings. And I think that's good enough for a lot of people because they don't really have, it's like they're living vicariously through him and how he makes them feel. And I think that is part of his value to a lot of people. And especially when it's so hard now for people to get clarity on some issues and even to try and seek that clarity out, make put yourself in an uncomfortable position. I think it's just a lot easier for people to tune into Alex and say, oh, well, the way this guy sounds 
it reminds me a lot of how I feel. So that's going to be good enough for me. And I'm, I'm not saying that um, in in any way to to demean um, his listenership at all, because like you said, you spent a great deal of time listening to him. And, you know, there's, there's lots of different kinds of people who take in his work for different reasons. Yeah. You know, that's why I was really excited to have this conversation. I'm also not nervous is the wrong word, but uh, let's use the word nervous because I also want to do the best job I can with it because I feel like it's so important. Yeah. And it's so difficult to have this conversation because it requires so much nuance. Well, and for me, it's difficult too, because he's such a contentious subject to some people. But even if it's like someone like you, who's not really coming from a place where you're trying to challenge me on my motivations for making the film, Alex is somebody that I know and who's been generous with his time and his participation on this project. So I want to remain objective, but I also don't really want to disparage him too much because I do think that he's also made some really important contributions for all of the things that he's also sort of screwed up, you know? So that's what another thing that makes it difficult to talk about. Yeah. So I want to read, I totally agree with that and I wouldn't expect you to it. And you spent so much time with him. You spent what, two years with Alex? Yeah. I mean, and it wasn't like we were like hanging out and like crushing beers on a boat the whole time. Like it, I mean, but he seems like a fun guy. Yeah. I mean, he seems like someone, like I said, he's endearing. He seems like a person that if you spent time with him and like Joe Rogan says, then Joe Rogan seems like a really well-adjusted human being. Right. So we struggle with this as a society too, which is holding contradictory ideas in our head at once right. and grappling with the messiness of humanity. That actually reminds me of what I, I said it when we were talking about the disclaimer. I mentioned the word authentic. Right. Because I think that was a very deliberately chosen word. And I think it speaks to, and I'm curious to know what you think. I'll just say this. I think it, it speaks to something that draws people to folks like Alex, to folks like Trump, who, while they absolutely contribute to perpetuating this atmosphere of misinformation, are also authentic. Alex is authentic and Trump's authentic also. And I think that this is what a lot of the politicians and institutionalists in Washington seem to fail to understand and where so much of the popularity for people like Alex and Trump and others like them come from. And I would love to try and dissect this from you because I think it's so important. Again, it speaks to this point that we were talking about earlier, which is that the gap between officially sanctioned speech, officially sanctioned reality, and what we experience to be true and feel to be true in our own lives has never been greater than in my entire lifetime. That's one. And number two, these folks feel so fake and inauthentic. And people want to feel like they're experiencing something real. And I, again, that I think also speaks to this whole thing about humanity. You know, when you look at Alex, he's a hot mess. You know, like he is a hot mess. And when he was, it was so funny when he was interviewing you guys who were on the, and it's endearing. It's endearing because you feel like you're looking at someone who's, struggling with life the way so many of us are struggling with life. We don't have it all together. We don't have this carefully you know, curated exterior like so many people try to have on their Instagram feeds or on their political platforms. And he's he doesn't have it all together. So mm-hmm. I wanted, there was something else I was going at with that. You wanted to, I can't, well, I can respond to the use of, ahead, the, of yeah. that word authentic. I agree with what you're saying. And I mean, Alec, he definitely does let it all hang out, the good and the bad and the ugly, so to speak. And so I tried to get as much as that of that as I could in the film. But, you know, when we're talking about that folksy authenticity of, you know, these populist figures that have emerged now that are, you know, refreshing and they're the antidote to somebody, you know, like Hillary Clinton or something, I do acknowledge that, yeah, that's definitely a potential, you know, buzzword, but the way that I was using it in the disclaimer, it's not really even really a disclaimer. It's more of a foreword. I just think that authenticity is something that I strive for in my work. And I really want to convey, when I say authenticity, I mean, conveying a sense of what it's really like to be there and to be around Mm. these people and to 
kind of push aside sort of these, you know, specter of like political correctness and all of this to just to say, okay, we all know what time we're living in. We all know that sometimes Alex is full of shit. We all know that there are real problems in the world, but can we just, can we just watch the movie so you can just get a genuine Mm. nuanced sense of the bigger picture of who this person is and who this character is? Because now, you know, since the film has come out, of course, NPR has, you know, put out a big long story like, who is Alex Jones? Like, where did he come from? And now people are suddenly very interested in that. But at the time that I started to make this film, you were only getting, you know, the worst possible, most narrow depiction of him, which begs the question, well, if this guy's so awful and so horrible, then why do so many people tune in to listen to him every day? And I just wanted mm-hmm. to shine a light on that. Well, good for you. Again, I think you've done a great job here. And I actually want to read one of the, my favorite reviews of the film, which was featured in Variety and which I also think was the most neutral or most, yeah, I think. I thought that was great. Yeah, I thought they did. And, you know, having a good faith approach to these kind of conversations is so important, you know, and people really want that. But my point that I was just trying to make is that the knee jerk reactions to everything that Alex does, again, speaks and confirms his point about the propaganda wars that right. so much is propaganda. So much of what comes out of mainstream news outlets is propaganda. And I, you know, I, I totally agree with that. So let me actually, oh, let me, two other things I wanted to say. I remembered what it was that um, when I was talking about Alex being a hot mess, in multiple interviews, he's talked about how fat he looked in the documentary and how much he didn't like it. And he brought it up, brought it up, brought it up Mm -hmm. in this hilariously honest way. It's the only thing he has to say about the movie, really. (laughs) It's so funny. (laughs) Because when I was shooting him, he's so used to, I mean, he's so used to being in front of a camera, usually his own cameras in his own studio with his own cameraman. But, I think I was just part of, and and there was so much happening at the time that I was filming him. It's not that we were super engaged at the time that I was shooting him. I was a fly on the wall a lot of the times or just another person in the crowd following him. Or also I had a a second camera person, but I don't even think that he knew that the movie was going to do anything. And so I don't really think that he was paying that much attention when we were actually shooting the film and so now when people ask him about the experience, the thing that he just defaults to is saying that he looked <laughs> fat because I don't think that he has any other, I don't think there was any other thing about it that stood out to him, which I think is good in, in some ways. He kind of thought that the whole thing, I mean, he did it, so he obviously took it seriously enough to commit the time and energy to it. I think that he didn't know that the film was going to go anywhere, and so he, yeah, he just sort of took it with a grain of salt, I guess. But yeah, well, you know, again, that speaks to the authenticity, to the, <laughs> to kind of the way that he, he approaches things, and he puts out so much content that um, right. He just thought it was one more thing. Exactly. There's a great scene also in the documentary that I loved, made me laugh so hard, was when he pissed on the Georgia Guidestones, mm, yeah, and he said one more thing off my bucket list, right. So there's actually a, I have so many quotes in the intelligence report for subscribers who are super nerd dear that I pulled from your documentary and from some other places while I was whatever you want to call it, doing my research or whatever you want, whatever right, term right. you want to use for it. So I'm going to read this one, and I I want to get your reaction of it. It's from the Variety magazine. I found it relatable on many levels. Again, as a former, like, intense listener of Alex Mm -hmm. Jones's. Yet, it wasn't all conspiracy. Jones was like a preacher, and what he was preaching was a religion. Stop the dehumanization. And really, who doesn't think contemporary America is dehumanized and only growing more so? Who doesn't feel at times in this society overly controlled by technology, by the corporation that rules the technology, by the government that works hand in glove with the corporations, by not just one, but two political parties that seem increasingly out of touch with the needs of average people. Jones, like Trump, tapped into all that. But what gave it meaning was the way that Jones, a political carny barker, used conspiracy to reverse engineer history. To him, every disaster, every predicament, Everything about our world you don't like had been planned and caused. By whom? By them. The globalists. The pedophiles. 
the technocrat corporatists who want to use vaccines to sterilize the population. How do you interpret that paragraph? How accurate do you think it is? I'm just curious to get your reaction. Awesome. I mean, that a career Hollywood critic, and I'm what was the name of... It? He's very well-known. Owen Glibberman. Yes. So he's very well-known, respected critic, and that somebody... I don't think he necessarily took that all away from my film, but he definitely summed it up. I can't really argue with anything there, especially as a perspective, as like a, a grounded like class, like someone who's probably like a, a classic style liberal. I think I couldn't really hope for any better takeaway than th that description. I mean, it's totally astute. Yeah, I totally felt so too. And, you know, let's just focus in on the, we talked about it a little bit earlier, but I want to talk about it a bit more. This this dehumanization, because it's come up for Alex all the time. And he's, it's amazing how consistent he is. I mean, he, very little has changed. I think the one thing that I wonder if it has changed with Alex, that, it, that maybe because I haven't watched enough content since back in the day, again, like I did some watching of his show, it feels like his ego has gotten smaller, maybe a little smaller. Has anyone told you that, that maybe he talks about himself less than he used to? Since I've known him gotten to know him. He's always at least projects an air of humility. He often says, I, I, I don't, you know, people will ask him about the film. Another thing that he'll say is I don't like looking at myself. I don't, I don't need to see, you know, it's just weird to watch a movie about yourself. And I'm sick of talking about myself. I'm, I'm sick of myself. That's another thing that, mm, he, that he says a lot. And I mean, maybe anybody would feel that way if they were on air for several hours a day for 25 years, the way that he's been. He's also so regularly sort of shamed by people outside of his immediate circle that, I mean, if it was me, I it would probably balance out my ego a little bit too. Mm. But I think he's more self-aware for somebody that seems so like wild and chaotic. He's a lot more self-aware than people give him credit for. And maybe it's better that he seems like he's just, the, you know, bumbling around, but he's actually not. And he understands the way that he's perceived and he understands his place in pop culture. And I think, and in the culture at large. And I think that he also, I don't know how he truly feels deep down, but I think he knows that that's probably the best way for him to at least portray himself, given all of the circumstances surrounding him. Mm. Yeah. Actually, there's another quote that I want to read at some point. I'll, I'll bring it up later, but it kind of gets, I think, deeper into his psychology and emotional state and sense of spirituality and kind of what mission he feels he's on. But let's actually stay on this point about the humanization because I'm curious. It kind of wraps into a, another question that I wanted to ask you, which was, what are some of the most unifying messages or feelings that you think people who follow Alex Jones or who travel in those same circles share. Is this one of them? Yes. And it's interesting because I do think that that's a theme that also flows over from my first film. This question of people feeling as if they're being left behind by, you know, quote unquote modernity. I think that Alex gives a voice to a lot of people who feel sort of stifled and left behind. Hmm either economically or socially. I mean, but I guess that's what populism is, right? Do you feel like that also speaks to something we we're talking about earlier? Or maybe we didn't. I mean, we talked about, I talked about how the film made me feel, especially the beginning, the simple shot of Joan speaking to a camera, mm -hmm. how it made me feel like I was about to watch Unsolved Mysteries, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I feel this way quite a bit. I, I feel like the world has become unrecognizable to me. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know that that is comparable to what our parents' generation. I mean, I understand that every generation feels, for the last 200 years or so, ever since the first industrial revolution, feels like the previous generation. Or when they get old enough, they feel like the new generation or the new world kind of feels very different. But I think that that is uniquely true for us. How much of a role does that play in, in what's happening in our society? Well, I think for people, what are you, are you a millennial? I am. I was born in 1981. Okay. So I'm 1983. 
I think for us, it's especially acute. And I'm sure that every generation feels that way a little bit, but I especially think that people in our age group, and I'm not even talking about Gen Z, but, you know, we of course went from, you know, having none of this stuff to having all of it. So that's a really huge leap, especially because there are people now who have jobs and are out there earning money who don't even remember before the iPhone, let alone before cell phones or before, you know, home computers. So it's quite a leap to make. And, you know, it can really put it in perspective when you go back and watch something that's only, you know, 20 years old and it feels like it's 100 years old, it can, mm. it can jostle you emotionally. And I think about it every day. So if that bleeds over in my work, then great. I think that's fine because that's, you know, what I'm thinking about. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if I mentioned this. I think I mentioned it to you, but I don't know if I mentioned it during the recording that actually the third episode we did was on the speed of change and how everything was speeding up. Right. And it was also about how also work was speeding up and people were working more hours. But in our fourth episode was on television history and culture because I was interested in exploring how television is a myth maker and how we tell stories about who we are and we look back in time. I mean, TV for you and me was still a big part of how we grew up. It had a big cultural presence. There were certain shows that we watched that were sort of a, a source of the common cultural fabric of our generation. And another interesting thing about that, and this is a little bit of a side tangent, but you mentioned Unsolved Mysteries. And um, I think some people don't realize who aren't millennials, especially, I mean, Gen X certainly remembers, but that in the 90s, sort of discussing conspiracy theories and, you know, there was a big trending moment culturally for all of that stuff where it felt super normal to discuss the paranormal and UFOs and cons conspiracy theories and JFK and, you know, Oliver Stone had a, you know, a, a blockbuster film about questioning the narrative around JFK. And now all of that stuff has gone sort of devolved again into being like something you're not supposed to t talk about or like that it's weird that anyone would want to talk about. But I'm very much a product of that time period as well. Unsolved mysteries and sightings and the X-Files. And, you know, I loved all of that stuff. So watching all that old footage of Alex does sort of remind me of that a little bit too. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, Alex also talks about that in the interview that you guys did on the Red, it's called the Red Scare, the podcast. Red Scare, right? yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is not the first time I've heard Alex talk about this. He's talked, I mean, he talks about this all the time, at least when I used to watch him. He's kind of mythologized in a sense, his childhood and his father figures, mm -hmm. his father, his grandfather. Oh, and he told right. that story about how his grandfather went and found a yearling calf, yeah, shot it in the head with like what 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 kind of, he described the revolver mm -hmm. that he used to shoot it, mm -hmm. took the tractor, dragged it up by its le hind legs, and they spent the next six hours cutting it open, <laughs> disemboweling it, carving up the calf. And then that night he said his grandmother and everyone were sitting eating filet mignon with red wine like aristocrats. Right. And it's very interesting the Again, this sense, and I think that also speaks to a common sense for a lot of people that their country is being taken away from them. Mm -hmm. The world that they grew up in is being taken away from them. Mm -hmm. And again, a lot of that is understandable. Mm -hmm. It is common. This happens. People, as they get older, they feel like the world is moving them by. But I can't help but wonder if, in fact, we're living through something that's profoundly different because I think, and this is where another thing that Alex has done a good job covering over the years. We talked about the humanization element or the dehumanization and humanity and the spirit. He talks about that quite a bit. The other thing is the subjugation component of it. Alex has always talked about this. The word he uses very commonly is slavery, that we're being enslaved, mm -hmm. that we're being subjugated. By whom? By the globalists, right? The pedophiles. But right. there is a level of subjugation that's going on in our society. Yeah. And the technology that exists today in our hands, these devices that we carry around, the surveillance state that's built up around us, exerts tighter and tighter levels of control. And the dilemma that Jones deals with and that we've covered on this podcast before, and I'm thinking, especially of episode 28, 
on industrial society and its future, which was the title of Ted Kaczynski's paper, which Bill Joy borrowed when he wrote Why the Future Doesn't Need Us, speaks exactly to this point, this tension. Again, the movie The Matrix, a hugely important film for our generation, yeah. dealt with this parable as well. The paradox between needing to destroy the machines that were trying to kill you and while at the same time needing those machines in order to live. And that's the world we're in today. We're in the world that Bill Joy talked about as a hypothetical, where we become so dependent on the machines that turning them off would be tantamount to suicide. Right. And it's not clear to me, and this is maybe a long-winded way of asking you this question to understand what you think Alex's end goal is. It's not clear to me what that solution is. For Ted Kaczynski, the solution was blowing up, as he called it, the whole stinking system and taking the consequences. But if you don't want to go down that route, and I think doing that at this point would be, as he said, tant them out to suicide, given where we are, what is the solution? How do you think Alex Jones sees that? I think that Alex thinks that he's going down with the ship. I don't think that he thinks he's going to keep the ship from sinking. So he thinks the ship is sinking, the house is burned, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I heard there's a point in the documentary where he says, I think he was at the Capitol and he said that he was in the husk of our former civilization. Mm -hmm. Does he, he thinks that this is inevitable? I mean, does he see it in sort of kind of like apocalyptic terms that there's death and resurrection? Again, in some ways he's remarkably consistent and in other ways you will see him sort of compensating from time to time to balance out his sort of negative rhetoric, apocalyptic rhetoric, which I think he kind of defaults to, but mm. he'll often say, you know, but, you know, listeners, are, you know, we can't get black pilled. We can still turn this around. And it's hard to say whether he actually thinks that we are can turn it around or if he just is saying that so that mm. he's not such a downer all the time. But I'm not sure that he even knows. And I also think that he probably sees his life purpose as being pretty much fulfilled, which is to sort of do his best. And even though I think at times he thinks that he would want, like to retire or just go and live on a farm and, you know, LARP out, you know, his his traditional lifestyle that that <laughs> that he advocates for. I don't see him ever retiring or stopping what he's doing. So I think he just is like the rest of us where he probably oscillates between hope and despair and sort of like lamenting the the present and its technologies, but also being, you know, totally mm. dependent on them. So, you know, it's definitely a struggle session for him and we just get to watch it on there every day. Well, towards the end of the film, you actually juxtapose two other scenes that capture that. And I'll, I'll quote it out here. Hopefully it's not too long, but I actually pulled it. He says he's being interviewed by you in the first part of the scene. And he says, I'm so past the politics and all the names and all the stuff doesn't even matter anymore. I'm just guilty because I've not raised my kids perfectly. And I'm like really freaked out by all of this and just trying to have a relationship with God so that my spirit gets out of this when I die. I mean, I really, that's all I think about. And I want to get out of this. And God says, I'm not allowed to. And he puts his hand to his face and he holds back tears. And then he says, so that's it. It's bad though. It's going to get real bad. Like you realize that all this isn't going to be here soon. I told my son three years ago, I said, you're going to get out of high school in a couple of years. There's not going to be a college for you, son. It's all going to be shut down. It's all going to be over. And now he listens to me finally. He's like, yeah, how'd you know? It's all done. It's all over. It's all over, Alex says. And then the next scene is him speaking to his listeners on the show again. And he says, no reason to get black pilled. A lot of people just get so negative they turn off. No, we're going through this process. We're being tested. Yes, it's negative, but it's good to discover it, to fight back against it. That's the process, but it's going to get a lot worse before it gets better. I think that captures yeah. so much of what, yeah. That's it. Yeah, that's exactly what you said. I think that captures a few things. One, again, it captures the authenticity of Alex Jones. You know, I, for all of Alex's faults as a communicator of, of information, I've never felt really that Alex was putting on, of course, he's a performer, no question, 
but I always felt like I could find something real in him. And there are so many scenes in your documentary and elsewhere where you can feel that he's really struggling. He's really struggling with this thing that he's been carrying around with him his whole life. I mean, again, you you pulled up uh, footage, a bunch of great vintage footage. Some of it was, I think he was speaking to an FBI agent over the whole Waco thing. There was another footage, piece of footage that you pulled from a DMV when he had gotten, when the government was changing. Mm, the, th the thumb scanners, yeah. Exactly. I mean, he has been on this ride from the very beginning. And I, I guess I'm, I'm curious to understand, where did that conviction around this come from? Was it, did you delve into that at all? Did you ask him, like, what sent him on this road? Was it, I know he talks so much about his dad. It seems that he really loves his dad. Actually, is his father still alive, actually? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Both his parents and they're still together and he's got a great relationship with them. Yeah. Well, that's how it's always sounded. And so, like, I, I never could quite understand if this was something that, for lack of a better word, he became indoctrinated at home because so much of the literature that he talks about, Gary Allen, for example, None Dare Call It a Conspiracy, a lot of the stuff, the Club of Rome, Limits to Growth, the Nella Meadows, a lot of this stuff came out of the 1970s. So I don't know how much of it is that he got shot out of a cannon with a certain amount of indoctrinated material. How much yeah. of it is also, again, you talk about it in the documentary, he talks about it, about how he got into a lot of fights. I mean, he's always been a kind of a brawler. So I'm just curious to understand how at such a young age, you had so much conviction around these same things that haven't changed much. I mean, I was trying to figure that out the whole time too. And I put the results of my interviews, I was trying to get at that with him pretty much the whole time. And I got what I got. And basically what he says is that he grew up around all these books and that, you know, there were elements sort of unique elements of his upbringing, including having relatives that were involved in the intelligence community, which is an interesting detail, I think, that sort of brought him around to sort of conspiracy-minded thinking. And, and of course, you know, his father is a, a conservative and a member of the John Birch Society. And I mean, he goes into all of it in the film, but to me, it doesn't really account for this sort of like lifelong crusade that he's been on. And one thing that this brings to mind is that every time I, two out of three interviews that I do about Alex Jones, the interviewer usually asks me if he's a phony or like a performance artist, or he's just an entertainer. He's just trying to rip people off. He's just trying to hawk his supplements. And I just don't think that those people really actually paid attention to the film or really know anything about him when they're asking me a question like that, because there's a hundred different, you know, thousands of different paths that he could have taken in his life. And he didn't, and it, it hasn't really been that easy of a road for him, no matter how much money people think that he's making off his business and what he's doing with his money. There's a lot easier ways to get success and notoriety, especially for somebody like him who, you know, especially as a young man, was a big, attractive, intelligent person. He probably could have gone on to any kind of broadcasting he'd wanted to do. But yeah, I mean, I just sort of digressed there, but I don't know. I think he actually believes in what he's doing and that it's sincere for sure. But I don't know how he got so much energy. I, oh, man. I don't know. He's a spark plug. Actually, I think someone had read once, someone described him as being built like a, quote, spark plug. I think he's, he reminds me of like a, I mean, we used to like sort of affectionately like refer to him as he's like a Yeti and he's like moving so fast and I'd have to, he's always moving from one place to another. So I was always just chasing after him and he's sort of like shaped like a refrigerator. So it's like for somebody <laughs> shaped like that to move as fast as he does. And he's just, he's never doing anything like without purpose. He's always like on his way to do something else and he's so kinetic and mm. it's a lot to keep up with. You had a lot of scenes from the January 6th mm -hmm. protest riot, not riot. What would you call it? I don't know what the official term I don't for know. I mean, I, insurrection I, is the official term. But the January 6th time at the Capitol where some people broke into the Capitol Hill building, yeah. that's actually not something I'm very curious about. Also, because there's yeah. really, it's clear that Alex really wasn't, it seems at least from everything I've seen, wasn't really involved in that. In fact, he was actively telling people not to enter. But like I said, I actually 
didn't even know that there were people that were saying he was involved mm -hmm. because I don't watch mainstream right. news outlets. Mm -hmm. But I'm actually more curious to understand what his views are around the 2020 election and its legitimacy. It sounds like he's very clearly believes that the election was stolen. Is that correct? Yes, I do think that he believes the election was stolen. I think that was what was going on when I ended up filming him. And of course, we were already working on the film before the election. So it wasn't like something, it was something that happened after we had already begun shooting him. So we didn't know that how any of it was going to unfold. And it wasn't like the point of the film was to frame him as this figure in this election uh, conspiracy stuff. But he definitely went out and was a part of all of these protests and marches in the wake of the election. And that was something that he hadn't done in a long time. He had sort of been just at the studio through most of the the Trump era. I mean, those were probably salad days for him comparatively to what's happening now. But I think that he also knew that having um, a Democratic leadership was going to affect him adversely. So that might have also been a motivating factor for him. But you know, he gained so much notoriety and listenership also through his affiliation with Trump. And that base of people have high expectations of him, even if he had reservations about Trump from time to time. I think that he felt obligated to go with the base and, and make a good showing because, you know, he's become such a important figure and especially to people in the MAGA movement. So, yeah, he got one out of the studio and he, you know, put on his sneakers and, and hit the dirt. But I definitely, definitely don't think that he was a part of any like dark plot to overthrow the government or anything like that. Certainly not. Yeah, it's funny because the only political candidate that I've ever seen Alex enthusiastically support that comes to memory is Ron Paul. Oh, yeah. He didn't even support his son, Rand Paul. Yeah, I should have. I regret that I didn't include that in the film because that was actually an important chapter for him. Well, because he is a libertarian. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, like if I were to nail him down as in a political category, the closest category I could come up for Alex Jones would be libertarian. But, of course, he was you know fervently against George Bush. So he's not. And, of course, the Trump. I mean, there's a quote in the documentary where he says, I don't trust Trump I trust Trump as far as I can throw an elephant. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. So he's clearly not like someone that uh, – I think, again, I, I think actually what Alex Jones disdains more than anything else is authority and specifically authority that seeks to tell him what he can and can't do with himself, with his life. 100%. But the thing I'm, I'm curious to understand is did you have a chance to speak with him? Did you ever ask him, Alex, why do you believe – that the election was stolen. What, uh, like, did you ever sort of try to rigorously test his thesis on that? No, because I was just there as an observer. I mean, I don't want to touch anything. I don't want to, I treat it like filming wildlife. So I'm not, I'm not like there. Like his son said, he's like a buffalo. Right. I mean, that really is how I wanted to treat filming him. And also, I was absorbing the information as like somebody who was, surrounded by it but it wasn't something that i particularly felt like i had a a horse in that race or a dog in that fight so i wasn't really and also alex probably knew a lot more about why he thought what he thought than i did and who was i it's like some petite woman who he just met who's falling with the camera to challenge him on you know his views about the election i was just there to film it and sort of distill and curate you know, the footage that I got and the information. Mm -hmm. But I know at the time, the big thing that they were, and of course, that's a closely knit group of people. So people who were working on doing that investigation into the election were also people who Alex knew. There's, it's a pretty small community, that sort of MAGA community. So he was getting his quote unquote intel before other people were, but they were obsessed with the voting machines at that point. When I first came on, like it was all about the Dominion voting machines. Mm -hmm. And of course, there are competing opinions about the the legitimacy of the claims made to election fraud. And I can't really say that 
I was just interested in documenting what people were talking about and how people were reacting as a filmmaker. And I was so absorbed in the work of just doing the film that I wasn't really like getting super hung up. I, I was just thinking, wow, this will be interesting for the film. I know that sounds detached and weird, but that's sort of how I felt about it at the time. I was like, whoa, this is, mm. how am I going to, um, you know, what's going to happen next? I mean, I was sort of experiencing it as a filmmaker, so... I think that's fine. First of all, like I said at the very beginning, I think we all need to be better at just not having a lot of judgment around these types of conversations. Yeah. Because we don't we can't really learn anything. You know, if every conversation becomes like a match of moral jujitsu, mm-hmm. and not only moral jujitsu, but one where we feel like it's performative. I have to be on the side of what I think is correct based on what other people think not based on what I feel to be true, mm. you know? And I think that's a huge disservice. But also, I don't know. I don't know what happened in the election. I don't have any way of knowing. I don't think anybody really does because it's wrapped up in so many layers of all of the things that we're talking about. I mean, it just depends on who you talk to and you could probably get a convincing case from either side. But I'm not one of these people that pretends to understand like the deep inner workings of like how our election system has been corrupted and, you know, what factors were at play. During. I mean, you know, I'm just trying to get through each day and, you know, yeah, I'm just like anybody else. But I'm definitely not one of those people who thinks I'm not like absolute that I that I know the truth about anything. And that's why I do the work that I do. Yeah, no, I mean, again, I actually think that's great. And I don't know if this film would have been possible otherwise. You had to gain Alex's trust and that trust had to be well placed. And honestly, like what kind of person does a documentary telling someone something that they want to hear and then, you know, does a hit piece on them? They're not very good people. So like, I don't necessarily want to watch a documentary from someone that con somebody under different pretenses and then ended up releasing something that is a hit piece on them, which is what a lot of people seem to think is journalism. Mm. But also, here's what happens, though. I made this film and I screened this film for a lot of different people privately before anybody had had a chance to review it or any journalists had a chance to put a spin on it. And plenty of, you know, liberal people, Democrats watched this film and they thought it was a really fair picture of him and they were still had their biases intact and they didn't like him anymore. And they were like, wow, you know, you really showed that he, you know, he is an asshole. And that's the thing is, you know, people, and then you give the press a chance to react to the film. And the same thing happened with my last film too. And they say, here's how you're supposed to feel about it. Here's what she actually Mm -hmm. did. She's a mouthpiece for him. This is a vanity piece, but it's not, it's a character portrait. It's a Mm. character study, right? So people will retroactively sort of tell you how to feel about the film. And that's why I don't let journalists get a hold of my work until, you know, the day that it comes out, because I at least want some people to be able to go in, you know, without judgment and watch the film. Yeah, that was my reaction when I watched it. I've actually watched it and I thought there were so many unflattering moments, but at the same time, I thought, I bet there are people that don't feel that when they see this. But I have, again, I I approached the documentary from my experience of having studied, listened to Alex, again, for so many hours. Yeah. But the reason that I, I bring up the 2020 election, it speaks to something that I think is actually what one of the most important things that we're all struggling with. And then what I find frustrating in our modern information ecosystem, which is that to your point, we don't really know, or let me correct that statement. Not When I say we don't really know the outcome of the election, what I mean is the vast majority of people, if you really push them, don't really know. Most people, they haven't spent enough time to feel really confident about something like that. The reason why most people feel confident one way or the other for most things in the world is because- They have heuristics that they rely on to tell them whether something is true or not. So if someone is very credible and believes something, and there's another person who's also very credible, and you have a series of people that are very credible and institutions that are credible, well, then you're just not going to doubt something. You're just going to believe it. The problem is that credibility in these institutions has fallen apart. And so people don't know what to believe. But the reason, and I I don't want to like be long-winded here, I I want to kind of make a point on it. The 2020 election is a good example that the, the, whatever you want to call it, the FBI breaking into Trump's residence in Mar-a-Lago is another good example. Trump immediately begins to spin it. Right-wing 
outlets begin to spin it pro Trump. The CNNs and the MSNBCs have been pushing anything anti Trump from the very beginning, the Russia conspiracy thing, which was always just, just felt like such bullshit. And there was so much bullshit around that. Mm -hmm. And the 2020 election, my sense is that it wasn't stolen, or at least not materially, based on the credible people that I follow. But I can understand why people would doubt that, mm -hmm. because there are people that are motivated to swing the election. And we don't really understand if that's possible, what it would take. And we're just living in this period of time in American society where people just don't know what to believe anymore for good reason. Mm -hmm. And where I get frustrated with Alex, and again, this wasn't the point of your documentary, but it's inevitable that when you do a documentary on a politically important figure, mm -hmm. it brings up political conversation. What frustrates me with Alex and with people who take positions that he does oftentimes is they point to the lies and the failures of the establishment. Alex Jones always does this. Whenever he's criticized, mm -hmm. also the same thing at the Sandy Hook trial. So many times they confronted him with material statements he made, and his response was basically, well, what about them? Right. What about what about WMD? What about the New York Times? What about Judy Miller? Of course. Blah, blah, blah. But that's not a responsible response. That's not a responsible way to approach life. I understand that Alex's approach is that it's all a war. We're all fighting an information war, so you got to fight back. But the problem is- Sandy Hook is not a one-off. Sandy Hook reflects what happens when every time the establishment puts out a narrative, your response is, it's bullshit. I'm going to come up with a completely different narrative to fight back because I don't believe their narrative. But I think it would benefit all of us if we were more honest about, one, how little we know and believe and trust today and just sit with that lack of trust and be able to kind of work through it which I think actually is, speaks to the importance of filmmakers and artists like yourself. And to also be empathetic, be open-minded, have these types of conversations, try to understand where other people are coming from because the country is super divided. You know, we didn't have a chance to talk about your documentary, TFW, No GF, Alex. I, I recommend people listen to both. But like that documentary captures so much of this, not the, the disinformation, the disillusion, the confusion, but it, it captures just the variety of experiences and the amount of, I guess, the thing about that particular documentary is the ways in which our society's different cultural subgroups and substrata have broken off and dissipated and distanced themselves from each other and the loneliness that exists in the world, the disconnection. And I just think these things are important and I commend you for you know really doing something that I think is courageous, which is putting yourself out there, doing a documentary about a figure who has been deplatformed. And that's scary because that could destroy, I mean, Alex is right. doing fine apparently, but that's going to destroy most people's lives. If you get banned from using certain payment processors, banned from using social media, it's devastating. Right. And I mean, that's a sort of a major theme that we didn't touch on yet, which is whether do you think that you approve of what Alex says or his messaging or not, really all of this putting on Alex on display currently is a question about whether or not people should have the right to say those things. And that's what people need to be paying attention to even more than the moralizing aspect of what Alex said is, you know, what does it mean for everybody else? Totally. So where do you think, I mean, in, in closing, Alex, I normally do, uh, a second part, but actually I, uh, during the course of this conversation, I decided that I'd rather keep this entire episode available on the main feed rather than break it up for premium subscribers. Where do you think this takes us? Where are we going with this kind of civic moment with the controlling forces in society, the deplatforming people's freedoms? I mean, where do you, how do you see that trending? Well, as we've been saying, since people don't know what's true anymore, they're sort of, they're defaulting to their tribes and they're defaulting more importantly to their emotions and their safety zones and where they feel safe because they feel that there's, a, you know, an imminent threat since, you know, it's the whole like fog of war thing. And we just need to be really careful, I think, during this process not to 
dismember the open marketplace of ideas out of fear. Um, and I don't think that we should let fear become the driving factor of our policy. And I think it's really important that the First Amendment remain intact and that everybody has a, a voice and that we don't let you know corporations step in and decide what we're allowed to hear and what we're allowed to think about because we're too, you know, frightened in our own lives to sort of confront, you know, things that make us uncomfortable. So that's something that I've been thinking a lot about too in, in regards to Alex Jones, obviously. Well, look, uh, Alex, like I said, uh, it was great having a chance to think about these things ahead of our conversation. It's a difficult topic. You've grappled with it very well and uh, you do really great work. And I, I highly recommend the documentary to everyone. They can download it, at least for now, <laughs> on Apple TV or on whatever yeah. the Apple marketplace is. Yes, it's on iTunes. It's on Amazon. It's on YouTube. I mean, it's kind of mysterious why they've just allowed it to exist. It's great. I mean, it's wonderful. And it's also on the alternative platforms if you want to support Rumble, Rockfin, Locals, or Odyssey. They're all playing it as well. So you can get it most places, pretty much everywhere but Netflix. How has it done? I'm not necessarily asking for numbers, but like generally, what's the reception been? Has it gotten a, a large listenership? Great. It's done great. I mean, it's still in the Apple charts. Of course, before the film came out, it was number two next to Top Gun on pre-orders. And you know, the film has been out for a couple of weeks now, but it seems like it's sort of hovering in, in the charts. And so that's good to see because it's definitely a slow burn and different people are arriving to the film at different times. And so I think it's doing pretty darn good for something about an alternative figure like him. Where can people learn more about you? And are you on Twitter? Do you have a Twitter account? No, I, I avoid Twitter. I'm too sensitive for Twitter. I do have an Instagram account. And yeah, I mean, I'm not really trying to be like a media figure or an activist or anything. I just want to keep making films and I'd rather speak through my work whenever possible. Well, that's refreshing, Alex. So again, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It was great speaking with you. Okay, thank you, Dimitri. Keep it up. For more information about this week's episode, or if you want easy access to related programming, visit our website at hiddenforces.io and subscribe to our free email list. If you want access to full episodes, transcripts, and intelligence reports, which include additional notes, resources, links, and other material that will help you get the most out of each and every episode, check out our premium subscription available through the Hidden Forces website at hiddenforces.io. Today's episode was produced by me and edited by Stylianos Nicolaou. For more episodes, you can check out our website at hiddenforces.io. Join the conversation at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hidden Forces Pod, or send me an email at dk at hiddenforces.io. As always, thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.